very happy to say as ever. David Myler is with us. Good evening. Joe, how are you? I'm very well, I'm very well. I mean, I hope you're doing okay, my man. I was thinking of you. I was thinking of you. Oh, yeah? Well, you know, I can't think of two people you love more than Jurgen Klopp and Roy Keane. Cork's beloved, Liverpool's saviour, fighting on national <laughs> television. I mean, it was like watching your parents growing, breaking up. I was, who would David pick to go and live with, Roy or Jurgen? Tough time for you. Ooh. I don't know. I'd have to go with Roy, wouldn't I? <laughs> Fellow Cork man. Um, I'd have to pick Roy over Jürgen. So, um, look, there's lots going on, and it feels like we've been talking about this Slovakia Ireland game for a long time, and suddenly it's here. Stephen Kenny has mm. named his squad. So, 8th of October in Bratislava, winners go on to face either Bosnia Herzegovina or Northern Ireland. As we know, that will be on the 12th of November. How were you in the build-up to these big do-or-die games? Did you relish them? Were you nervous? Were you, you know, thinking about it non-stop? What was your approach? I think at the start, you're not really thinking about it. You're more focused on your own club and that you're, like, playing regularly. Because if you're not playing, you're kind of going into, you know, an international camp thinking, the manager's probably not going to pick me. So in the weeks leading up to it, you're probably more focused on your club. But it's kind of after this weekend is gone and then the kind of like the lads set their sights on traveling over to you know Ireland to meet up with the team meet up with the manager then it starts kind of sinking in um it, it, it's always in the back of your mind but you know these these are the moments you live for um these types of games where it's kind of like you said do or die um I was fortunate enough to play in a few of them big big games you know even the Wales one is the one I kind of draw on all the time like that was a surreal moment for me and it's it's when I look back on with you know fond memories and you know, people still come up to me and talk about my performance that night and, you know, to be a part of something, you know, was special. And obviously for me, being captain was immense, you know, for, for my family and myself. So I think the boys have to look forward to these games because they're the moments that you remember. Well, it's still the last time we've beaten opposition of note away from home, really, October 2017. I know. It's, it's, it is hard to believe. Um, like if you look at yeah we played Denmark and all that you know they were tough games we've had some hard games but it's not a great record to have but at the same time I still feel we are capable of going away and getting results like whoever we may face of course look if you play your Frances your Germanys your Hollands Englands they're you know they're very good teams but I wouldn't fear Slovakia as I would those and I think you know we can get at them we can create chances we can score goals you know, we just need someone to, you know, take on the mantle that, you know, wants to score the important goals like Robbie Keane did for so many years. For one thing, they won't have to deal with the atmosphere, which is, you know, it's got to be a major advantage. I can still remember the atmosphere vividly through the television that night and the Welsh anthem was sang a cappella and it felt like the place was shaking. So they don't have to deal with any of that. What's your memory of that atmosphere? Did it help you or was it actually something to really try and overcome? Well, word had got round that they were going to do it. Um, now, when I signed with Reading, I remember asking Chris Gunther about it, and he said, no, it was done, it was a mistake. But we had heard two, three days previous, Martin had pulled me and said, like, he had heard that this was going to happen. All that. It actually spurred me on. Um, I actually, like, when they sang the national anthem, it was amazing. There's no, there's no doubt in that. Um, it was incredible. You know, Cardiff was a tiny little stadium. Um, so, like, everybody proudly sang the Welsh national anthem. But I think it kind of it kind of made us focus and switch on more. And I remember when we were in the huddle and I gave a talk, like I was shaking and fellas were looking at me and they could see, they could see it. Like um, it was, the emotion was coming out of me into them. Like I, I never for one moment in that game felt that we would lose. Even when we scored, I just, I trusted the lads, you know, the back four, everyone so much that like, I knew we would get the result. Mm. My other memory that night is you and James McLean uh, combining to take per Joe Allen out of the game? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know what? Joe Joe actually came up to me after the game. He wasn't happy. Of course, they had lost, but, you know, he'd gone off. I think it was with um, a concussion. Mm. But if you look back at it, I think James pushes him, and I jump, and, like, I think his head hits my, like, hip bone or something, and then McLean clatters him as well. But that kind of, I think for, for us, it's like, in big games like that, it's like, you know, the first moment, the first tackle, the first header... You know, the first shot on target, the first corner, you know, those kind of things. And it was a big tackle. I remember, um, I think Joe Allen had caught me a couple of minutes before in a tackle. And I was going to say, right, I'll get him back. 
Um, albeit I didn't like really mean to tackle him there. I was kind of like a clumsy kind of coming together, but it was kind of, we set our marker up that we weren't going to be pushed over that like we were there to fight. And, you know, you often see any of these, you know, pundits talking. The first thing you've got to do is you've got to roll your sleeves up and you've got to, you know, fight, you know, you like, there's a famous quote I heard off somebody years ago was like professional sport is the only job where somebody is physically trying to stop you doing your job. Like if you look at any, any other job and we were there to stop them and they were there to stop us. And we let them know that we weren't going to be pushed over. And like I said, I always felt we were going to get a result. Mm. And as much as Ireland are now trying to play football under Stephen Kenny, that attitude, that physicality, to be frank, is always, especially in those bigger games, especially against good opposition, it's going to be something that we're going to have to have in our armory. Of course. Like, it's not... The, the problem I have is I think people have this, you know, perception that we're going to just all of a sudden just play like Barcelona. Not like to the level they did, like, but, you know, just keep playing and playing. But there's going to be times when you're not going to be able to dominate the ball from start to finish for a complete and entire 90 minutes. We're going to have to, you know, at times drop back, you know, set up in the, if Stephen plays the 4-3-3, three, three, then set up, you know, a back four, a solid five in midfield and get the striker to come back. We're going to have to, you know, there's going to be times when teams are going to get on the ball and they're going to make it difficult for us. That's just part and parcel of it. There's going to be stages when I think the big thing that needs to be more encouraged, which I think, you know, Stephen is doing, um, that... You know, we probably, certainly in my era when we played, that we probably should have been better at when we turned over possession to then keep hold of it. We were always looking to straight away counterattack constantly that we never actually retain possession for, you know, if, even if you talk about 10 to 15 passes that the opposition then drop back off you. We were turning over possession far too easily. And I think Stephen is now trying to change that, mm. that he's trying to get them to, you know, control the ball, you know, on turnovers. It seems like Slovakia can certainly hold on to the ball as well. If there is a worrying combination from the Bulgaria-Finland game, it is, uh, you know, certainly as much as Ireland are now intent on trying to play football, it's not like it all suddenly worked, you know, and how can it overnight? How can we suddenly become fluid and create loads of chances? So that didn't happen. And yet we certainly conceded a really poor quality of goal. So those two things together, that's not a good combination, obviously, for a match like this. Uh, talk to us about both, what we did on the ball and then the weird, you know, because we, we, we traditionally have been pretty good defensively, the, the, the weird lapses mm. in concentration for the goals we conceded. Well, if you, first thing, you have to look at, you know, the situation that the whole world is in with COVID, right? That, you know, the leagues are cut short and whatever, and then there's, you know, we restart and then there's a break. Like, so lads hadn't been playing regular football, you know, and that's it. It was like... It was a pre-season for them in the sense that they weren't up to speed. Like I even saw Stephen Kenny's press conference the other day. I, I couldn't believe it when he he mentioned Shane Duffy had only played one league game, you know, with Brighton to think like how long. And then he comes in and he's captain in both games. So there's going to be a lot of rustiness. Now, we, we just touched on what Stephen's trying to get to do with the lads playing football. Like whenever the games were on, they'd have met up on the Sunday night. Stephen has Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, Thursday to work on everything with them. And I think it's, it is very difficult to get so many messages across. Now, I've spoken to a few lads, like they've said different things or whatever, like they've all, all been really positive, but there's only so much he can get across them in that time that when they step out in the pitch that they can remember it all. Because a lot of it, a lot of it comes from, it's the player's confidence, you know? Um, the players have got to go out and have confidence to get on the ball and, you know, play it. A lot like, spoke to, you know, Conor Horan quite a bit after the game because he asked me how he thought he did and whatever. And I said, like, at times, we're just playing the ball. It's almost for the sake of playing the ball. There's no, like, purpose to, if we're going to go forward, then we go forward with purpose. Like, they're knocking balls around midfield. They're knocking around the back. But if you watch any of the top teams, I think, like, for me, the best team in England is Liverpool. But if you watch them, like Mikel Arteta spoke, but they're knocking the ball around the back and then Van Dijk hits a 70-yard diag onto Mo Salah's, you know, toe. So it's very hard for, you know, Arsenal to press them because if they go long, Liverpool go long, then they're in. Like, at the moment, we're, we're, we're in, a, like, adapting phase that we're trying to find the balance of it. So I do think those Bulgarian-Finland games will have been huge for the sake of the players coming in, getting to know Stephen, 
working with Stephen for that, you know, week to 10 days, that I think by the time the Slovakia came, when he's had another full week of training, I think the lads will be really geared up and clued up to what he's after and what's required of them to play in the games. Mm. So I like I'm I'm really optimistic and really positive about the Slovakia game because I think like like I said, I believe we can get a result, but also the fact that Stephen has had that last camp to work with them now coming forward that they know where you know they they know what Stephen's after because it's it's a lot different at club level when Stephen like could have worked with players, you know, for a full preseason, which is usually six, seven weeks now that he kind of gets into a camp and it's a quick turnaround before the games are there, you know? Mm. That's really fascinating because, look, you can't be at your free-flowing best as a team if you're all trying to digest a lot of information on the pitch in real time. Yeah, of course. Um, it's normal, you know. Some of the some of the best I advice there is uh, sorry the best advice I received was like a manager Steve Bruce came to me one day on my debut just pulled my jersey and said just pass the ball pass the ball to someone wearing that jersey that's all you need to do and at times we can overcomplicate it um, like that 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 is the beauty of football mm. I, I'm not saying that Stephen is overcomplicated or he's giving them too much information but we are changing a lot from what we were used to because we were solid, we were compact, we were hard to beat. You always felt that McLean would probably pop up with a goal. When Wes played, you could give the ball to Wes anywhere, he'd deal with it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? We were, we had found, our, we probably found our niche in the way to play and to get results. Yeah. I'm not saying it was super negative. We were always encouraged to take the ball. You know, it's not as if, never once did I hear Martin say like, shell it up the pitch or, you know, he used to roar and scream daily, like at, I was certainly one of them, like, get on the ball and make something happen, you know? Like, you have, you know, like, look, opinions are one thing, right? But you have, like, Roy, who worked with him, best midfielder in the Premier League history. Like, he never once, like, said, like, you know, shell the ball. If you watch some of the games where he was involved on the sideline, he screamed at midfielders to get on the ball. Mm. You know, he's saying, keep the ball, work it, and whatever. Mm. So it's going to, look, it's going to take time, but it's good like our conversation would be totally different if we'd beaten Bulgaria and Finland comfortably playing fantastic football but there were positive signs and I do think having that camp coming into the next camp I think the lads would be proper geared up and so uh, Stephen Kenny's trying to give them I presume some kind of framework for how they're to move around the pitch and how they're to move the ball uh, do you suspect it's it's dramatically different to the point where players are thinking, oh, should I be making a forward run here, or am I meant to stop, or what am I meant to be doing here? Like, can it get, can it get to that kind of an, ex an, ex an extent? Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say to the extent you said. I think the problem you have is that when when you're working through phases of play and you're talking about like when the right back receives the ball, the midfielder you know peels out or you know, which position they go. But you've got to remember, some of this stuff at times in training will be un, you know, unfazed. So there's nobody pressing you or closing you down. That, or even if you are doing it with, you know, opponents trying to close you down, then like it's only light hard because it's training. Where it's in, it's in, when it's in a game, mm. the opposition are really trying to stop you. Mm. And then it almost, like players can almost, what's the best way to probably phrase it? They kind of have a you know a brain freeze where they think, oh well, the manager's encouraging me to make this run over here, but the opposition is stopping me. What am I going to do now? It can be almost become static that you're you're trying to do what you've been told so much mm. that a lot of football has to come that like the best players in the world are creative. They think on their feet and they think on the spot. Do you know you can't like even you see like Ronald Koeman talking about Lionel Messi. You you don't coach him. You can't coach him like because he knows what to do. It's yeah. it's a feel in the moment. It's just like we have to just find the balance. And I don't know if you noticed in the Bulgaria game. I mentioned this to Dan last night. It was part of a similar ish conversation. So I don't want to go overboard on this, but it was just a, mm -hmm. a small example which maybe exemplifies what you're talking about. In the Bulgaria game, first minute, Shane Duffy brought the ball into midfield, lost it quite badly, and then he tried something later on similar, lost the ball again. But there were a couple of moments where Duffy was in possession and Bulgaria had fallen back a bit. And James McCarthy was physically, you know, hands out, letting everybody know, you know, you're meant to come into midfield with the ball, draw a man. And there were times where he yeah. was like throwing his arm, kind of waving him forward when he had the ball and Duffy didn't do it. And then remonstrations between the two. And I thought, well, that, that is interesting. Certainly McCarthy's of the opinion that Duffy should be taking that ball into midfield. And I couldn't work out 
has Duffy lost his nerve a little bit, feeling a bit rusty, or he doesn't agree with McCarthy that that is what I should be doing on the ball? And it was just these are the little dynamics that suddenly spring mm -hmm. up, and, and I suspect Stephen Kenny and the team will be talking about. It. I don't know. Did you even notice that going on? No, I, I didn't notice it. Of course, when you look, if a centre half has the ball in the space in front of him, you're always told to drive into the space. Yeah. It's obviously like whether or not Stephen is told Shane to do that, it's something Shane should do regardless. Do you know? But as you said, the, the thing is like with Shane coming forward losing the ball, then Shane coming forward losing it again, you start to think, I don't really want to be going in there. I don't want to be losing the ball time after time because he's you know centre back with Egan. If he loses the ball, you know they could be they're in they're in on goal. So that might have been for him on that occasion. It's just probably a confidence thing. Yeah. Like I said, you know Stephen had said he's not played much football. He's now gone to Celtic. Oh, God, I I don't know, but he, I think he's top scorer with all the headers he's scoring. Um, yeah. But and those someone, games will help him. And someone made the point with Celtic, he has quite a lot of possession, and those demands will be on him to take the ball out at times. I'm sure that was interesting. You know, so uh, Conor Harran might give you a buzz or check in and ask for advice. Is that something he regularly does? Well, no, it's more, it's more, it's more of a catch up. Um, I've known Conor a long time, and we get on really well. And obviously, we play both played in midfield. Well, I played, he plays. Um, but it's someone. Like I'm close with him. I get on really well. I'm, I'm happy to see him playing, doing well, obviously, with Villa. Um, I know now they've signed Ross Barkley, so it'll be a bit of competition for him. Um, but at the same time, I want to see him doing well. And, you know, we, we, we catch up on the phone. Um, so we're due to play golf now soon. So, hmm. Did you call anyone in your playing career and ask them to give an outside view on how you were doing? Um, well... First and foremost, as you well know, I had my father. Um, he didn't miss many games, so he was quick to tell me what <laughs> he, he thought. He, he called you. You didn't call him. <laughs> uh, no, there, look, look. There was times. Um, there was times when, you know, Roy was obviously working with Martin. Obviously, I was playing with Hull. Roy was living in Manchester, so you know they used to go along to see games. Um, Roy used to come to games. Obviously, when Roy was there, word would filter down to me. Roy is here and whatever. Um, and. What you call it? I used to, you know, ring him or text him after the game, um, because I knew like if he'd been over, he'd be driving home to Manchester. So I'd be, I'd be curious to know his thoughts. Um, he, like he was great. He used to just, he'd sit you down, he'd talk you through from start to finish, what he thought you did well, what you think you can improve on, what you didn't do well. Um, gave me great feedback. It was very, very honest, as you can imagine. Um, and can I stop I was, you there? Because I, I, uh, he, he is criticised as a pundit for maybe. Uh, lacking specifics or not breaking down the game the way a Gary Neville or a Jamie Carragher does, you know, with the screen and pointing yeah, at yeah. various tactical things. So when he's giving you advice, is it specific and, and, and insightful? Or is, you know, because on TV, he can have the reputation for being a bit too much focused on things like attitude and put in a tackle man and, you know, that kind of stuff. Was he giving yeah, yeah, you good yeah. tactical stuff? Oh, yeah, he, he'd, he'd run through everything with me. He'd be very specific to me. Right. You know, he would go through things with me as a midfielder. Any examples um, you can think of of things he used to pick you up on? Yeah, it might be might be something of do you do you remember when you conceded that chance? Um, blah blah blah, and then you'd be kind of going, you'd be trying to rack your brain because you like you've just played a game and going through your emotions are high and whatever. Um, and I'd be going, yeah, yeah, and he'd say like you should be five yards across, right. doing that because you can cut that passing lane at times. You're charging out to, you know, block the man. Whereas, like, where's the danger? And I'm like, well, the danger is the goal or the ball in behind me. And he's like, well, hold your ground. Mm, okay. Like the ball in front of you with the man is better than the man with the ball behind you. He said, you don't want to be chasing back. Little things like that. Like there was, look. But sorry, the little things. The, the little things is the real understanding and and, and you know yeah. the genius of the game. I I almost think the little things is more impressive than someone able to say the bigger things. Yeah, of course. But look, there was there was many occasions with Ireland when I had you know chats with him about games. It's just probably, like you said, I'll, I'll stop you there because a lot of people don't speak out and say about this, that, and the other. You know, they don't they don't talk about these things because it might be only small snippets of information, but you start to think about them, and it's his understanding of the game that he's trying to you know pass on a message for you to play better or improve your performance. And like certain things, like that was the big one. For me, it was like, if the man is in front of me and he has the ball, I don't necessarily need to go and close him down because I'm the nearest man. Mm. Like, the ball in front of me is better. If I can make him play it sideways, great. If I can make him play backwards, fantastic. 
but I don't need to steam out of like my position and get the ball pop around me, which in my early days, my career, I probably did a little bit too much that as I got older, I started to understand the game, understand the position a lot better. Mm. It's kind of a cool thing, isn't it, for the boy from Cork to be able to pick Roy Keane's brain after a match, you know? I guess he would have, you know, respected you doing that as well and, and liked the fact that you were doing that as well. So I'd say they're enjoyable conversations to have. Well, they were very enjoyable until, unless I had a bad performance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or yeah. I, can, I, can, I can bring up one occasion. Um, I can't remember what had happened. Um, well, I was, coming, I was coming to the end of my contract at Hull or something like that. And he actually drove over from Manchester for a game. So he's sitting, he was sitting in the car, in the car park, waiting, obviously, because obviously he doesn't want to go in and people would be bothering me, kind of want to slip in right on kickoff, I imagine. But I walked past his car and he beeped the horn. And I looked at him like, and he said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm not involved. And he went, he went, I'm fucking driven all this way over to see you, you know, to see you playing. You're not even, you're not even playing. And I was like, yeah, well, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was like, yeah, probably the wrong fella. But at the same time, look at these things happen. Sure. So with your right back hat on and as somebody who kind of adjusted to playing right back, I just want to play a clip here. It's Matt, yeah. da Matt Doherty, because obviously Spurs have, God, I don't know how many games coming up. So they're playing last night. They have Maccabee Haifa coming tomorrow. By the way, we should talk about burnout at some stage because the schedule is just nuts for so many of these players. But Spurs play tomorrow. Matt Doherty was doing the press conference today. He was, he was fantastic all the way through. Really, like, absolutely one of the better speakers and full of insights. But uh, he talks later on about adjusting to right back in a back four, which I want to get your thoughts on. But first of all, asked about the battle with Seamus Coleman for the Irish number two jersey. Look, I, I played the last few games. It's always going to be a constant battle between me and Seamus. Um, and that's fine. Like Whoever plays, we have the full support of each other. We'd obviously both like to play. Um, and we feel and we feel like we, we can play in some way together. But um, that's, not really, that's not really up to us. That's up to, up to the manager. But um, I don't think being a... Um, being at a bigger club than Wolves will necessarily guarantee me to play. Um, he's the captain at the end of the day. Um, and we all know the credentials that he has. And we know how good he's been um, and consistent he's been in the Premier League. And for Ireland over the last probably, how old, you know, probably eight, eight, nine, eight, nine years. So, um, look, it's probably, it's probably a 50-50 with who plays. Um, I know he's in pretty good form at the moment, so I might have to... I have to up my game over the, over the next couple of days. I was just wondering, there's been um, a bit of switching between the different systems, three at the back, four at the back. You obviously played last season mainly as a wing back. How how different are those two positions to play, right back or right wing back? Oh yeah, like very different. I know people might not think they're that much different, but they are. Um, just positionally, like it. I think I realised once once I went into a back four consistently um, since the start of the season that. You just don't actually have to do as much defending as a as a wing back. Um, so look, it's it's for me going into a back four. It's definitely tougher. It's something I have to, which I am actually get. I'm getting used to and and, and improving with, with each game. Um, so the different the differences are there mostly mostly defensively. Um, I'm still able to get in back post and stuff. I'm still able to go. I'm still able to go forward. Um, but it's just harder work because you're coming from you're coming from deeper. Um, and you're not necessarily up the pitch up the pitch all the time. Um, defensively, though, it's just a lot about your position. Um, I think when you play wing backs for so long, you kind of pick up a few few bad habits, and um, you probably don't get in in as tight to your centre back as, as much as you should, and your body positions, etc. So, um, yeah, look, I'm I'm still I'm still learning. I'm still I'm still able to improve playing in the, in the back four. So, um, it's something that I'm actually excited about doing in terms of um, I know that I can play wing back, but just being able to kind of Get myself back into this type of shape, um, and trying to and trying to like excel in that shape also. So yeah, I'm pretty excited to be, to be playing back four. Yeah, Matt Doherty there. It's Joe Malloy here with David Myler. First off, how well does he come across? Not dissimilar to yourself actually in press conferences, just honest and interesting. Yeah, um, I think at certain times there's a few lads are kind of probably a bit too media trained. Um, in the way they speak, it's it's better to nearly be natural and more honest, you know. And I think more people will appeal to you if you do, 
say it as you see it. Mm. You know, it's like, look, you mightn't agree with everything I say, but if I'm honest, you have to respect that. Um, and I think Matt is honest there. You know, it is, it is probably the toughest call that Stephen has is the two of them. Um, like, both great lads, both great players. Um, they get on really well. It's just, it's so tough. You know, it's almost like we want, we're desperate for Stephen to probably play wing back so that he could play Enda and, you know, Matt, and then he can play, you know, Seamus in the back three because at the moment they're probably two. I know Callum had a great performance against Chelsea, but like they're probably two of the most informed players in the Irish team, mm. you know? I sometimes look at Matt Doherty and you know the way he'll, he'll come inside, you know, he's yeah. brilliant to come inside. Sometimes looking at him lately, given the Coleman situation, and I'm thinking, okay, if we McCarthy's probably in there and Hendricks kind of in there, this guy really likes coming inside. Could could he, with you know, a few training sessions under his belt, do a job in there and, and grow into that role, or is it just too much of an ask? I wonder. It's it's a it's a big ask. Is it? Because the the, the thing I'll say to you, Joe, if you look at it like this, when you play right back, for the games I played right back, you receive the ball. And in your peripheral vision, you can see the left winger closing you down. But you know that there's nobody behind you here. You know there's nobody, like, your fella here is your, you know, a half partner who more than likely is passing you the ball. When you're in the middle, anyone can come from anywhere to receive the ball. It's not a case of you can just slot into, you know, midfield. Mm. Yes, of course, look, somebody would be quick to say to me, oh, look at Philip Lamb, but you're talking about an exceptionally gifted footballer who's... Like, by all accounts, uh, if you listen to Pep Guardiola speak about him, he's the most intelligent footballer he's ever worked with. Do you know that he could understand it? Mm. But receiving the ball constantly in different angles rather than the ball comes out to you and you've got the whole pitch in front of you and you can see the entire picture, you know, it's a lot different. Yeah, no, I accept that. Not least for a game of this importance, you know, whatever they're mm. trying to down the line. Have you got a strong... Coleman or Doherty leaning for the Slovakia game? Well, I, before before I was on the show in the morning and I said I'd fancy Seamus to start, I said I'd go with Seamus. I, I get on really well with the two of them. Like, I, I've known Seamus longer. Um, I played 21s with Seamus all the way up. We're very close. We mm. speak every, you know, a couple of days or whatever. Um, right. Like, I get on really well with Matt, so it's like, it's, it's, yeah, a, tough it's a tough one, but for me, for me, I've said it and I always said I'd be honest, even when I've said it to the lads, if I'm ever doing stuff, I think I would play Seamus. Seamus is a better defender than Matt. Matt is better going forward, even though Seamus at the moment has, it's almost as if he's found a second gear from not playing in either, you know, the Bulgaria game or the Finland game. He's yeah. really kicked on a level. You know, obviously he's had massive doubts where people have raised, you know, after, you know, probably Everton's form, which is kind of a collective thing rather than an individual thing, whereas from the outside, we're looking in, we're all focusing on Seamus because he's our captain and we want to see him do well, but, you know, Everton was struggling. I think that was a collective thing. Now they're flying. He looks like the 25, 26-year-old Seamus Coleman that was in the PFA team of the year. Mm. He looks like that for, like, getting forward, getting to the byline. I think a big thing for him at Everton at the moment is... It's probably the midfielders they've signed with Alan. Um, you know, he, he he reads the game really well. And he, if you watch any top team where the fullback gets forward constantly, a lot of the time the midfielder is doing a lot of work to cover over and protect his position. That's how I think if you look at Liverpool, Henderson does a lot of work to cover over on him. Um, so it's like Everton now have found that where the fullbacks can afford to get forward, mm. you know, but as Matt said, he is learning the position. It is a lot different, you know. Starting at a starting in a wing back position, you're you know inevitably twenty year twenty yards higher, and you don't have to really work back as much. You're kind of like the amount of times last season we saw Matt appearing at the back post, trying to get on the end of crosses from the left wing back, um, is was phenomenal, and that's why he scored so many goals for Wolves. Mm. Did you do right wing back or right back in a flat four for Ireland at times? Can't quite remember. I, I did know I played, um, we never, Martin never played wing backs. I yeah, played um, yeah. in the back four. Yeah. Okay. And you found it out, you, from memory, you did very well. I did all right. I did all right. Consider. First game was against, first game was against Gibraltar. Um, and you kept them quiet? Seven. You kept them quiet? <laughs> one seven, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was, it was, it was a nice introduction, should I say. But yeah. at the time, we had Robbie Keane on the pitch. 
I Robbie scored a hat trick, I think, after half an hour. Yeah. I remember I think I think Martin took him off after an hour and I think Robbie was fuming because <laughs> I think he was gonna like Robbie felt he was gonna score six or seven goals. Yeah. Then I went into the Germany game, which is a few days after, which then is a total different kettle of fish. Um like I was lucky um because I had John O'Shea playing right centre half and I had John Walters in front of me. Mm. Two men I greatly admire, have massive respect for, you know great experience internationally. They helped me a lot. And John did a lot of, a lot of work for me. Um, you know, so that, in that case, it was probably a lot different because I just had to defend. Mm. I don't think I crossed the halfway line maybe to take a throw in or, you know, or something, but we, I was never bombing forward. It was more like, like, I just remember, I think John spoke to me for, you know, 90 minutes, like, up five yards, drop five yards, in five yards, out five yards. You know, he kind of, he coached me through the game. And then I had Walters in front of me who was, you know, just doing his job. And um, no, was, look, I was lucky in that sense. But yeah. going forward, I don't think, I don't think Martin would have wanted me like bombing forward <laughs> as the as the threat. Like, Listen. Uh, brilliant. We could talk all night. You have a, you have a John Giles-esque ability to remember the specifics of all these games, which is great for a chat like this. Thanks so much. I'm sure we'll probably check in at some stage next week with the game. David Myler, thanks a mil. Thank you. Thank you.